to the Refugees in a New Land podcast from the Times News and MagicValley.com. We're following a refugee family from the Democratic Republic of the Congo as they move to Twin Falls and start a new life. Here's Enterprise Editor Virginia Hutchins. Two weeks into my team's year-long reporting project, I was pretty nervous. We'd already invested a lot of reporting and photography time, but we still didn't have permission from refugees Connie Gamba Mulabwe and Beatrice Bahati to follow them and their two children through their first year of American life. Reporter Titona Dunlap and our two photographers were among the sea of faces that Mulabwe and Bahati saw after touching down at the Twin Falls Airport November 16 and in the two weeks that followed. The couple knew they were journalists and courteously answered their questions, but because of the language and cultural barriers, Titona still hadn't explained our mission to the couple and asked for their permission to become part of their lives for a whole year. And we still knew very little about the couple's experiences in the Democratic Republic of the Congo or in Malawi where they fled. Now it was time. Through interpreter Mary Lupumba, who speaks Swahili and English, Titona made an appointment to visit the family at home November 27. Here's Titona. I wanted the couple to be at ease so I could get a sense of how they acted at home, but the reception was formal. They politely showed me to a chair and invited me to ask questions. I tried for informal conversation, but with the need for an interpreter, it turned into more of a list of questions and answers. And the questions got a lot more difficult to ask when we got to the point in Mlawe's story when his parents were killed and he fled from the DR Congo, just running. Was both of his parents dead by that point? Mm. Did, was it something that happened in front of him? Uh, he says that's a difficult question to answer because if he starts talking about how his parents died, it would be like I have memories that he even does not want to remember. Okay. Yeah. Malawi was more willing to talk when I asked about conditions in the refugee camp in Malawi. What is the camp like? Like, where where do you sleep? Is there a lot of people, I don't know, trying to fight for the same things, like food and clothing? Okay, so My Asking follow-up questions was a lot harder than I'm used to, and sometimes I had to ask the simple yes and no questions that I usually try to avoid. I just didn't know enough yet. Oh, okay. So what, what they do is they give out um, a few things for you, mm -hmm. and they give you a place. Like a, a bare place, and then when you go there, you have to build something there for yourself. Okay. So that was what was done for him. He was given a, a blanket, and then he was given a bed where he could build for this. Just like you said, he was given a blanket. Well, what else? Like a blanket. Like a blanket. So they give out, they will bring you right, they give you a blanket and then they also support you with food, they give you food, so every month they give people food. Okay. Was there a shortage of food too? Okay, they, they, they give they give everyone, but then not uh, a lot for for it to last for a month. Mm -hmm. While we talked, Bahati was in the kitchen preparing fish for lunch. So, like getting water, did they have to like go to like a I don't know, like a pipe and that piped in or? and then carry it to their house. Okay, 
So do they like how it is now, where you just turn on the faucet? <laughs> I asked Malabwe what he wants people here in his new city to know about the place he came from. Okay, so he says he would love uh, people here to know a lot more about the person life. Uh, he became a Christian and he invited that day I asked the big question would the family be willing to let me and my Times News colleagues follow them for a year for a special series of stories and photos after a few moments of consideration, less time than I thought they would need, the couple gave me a simple yes. I ended that interview by asking if the family had any questions for me. I thought they might ask why we chose them for this year-long reporting project, but their question was one I didn't expect. <laughs> okay, they are asking, I don't think it's part of that, but if you could open it, like, turn on the TV. Oh. If, if you could. Is it like, you know what I think they need is uh, an antenna? I didn't have a babysitter that day, and my six-year-old stepdaughter Kaylin was off school for the Thanksgiving break, so I brought her along. Kaylin sat silently at the table for most of the interview, but toward the end, three-year-old Sarah Malabwe offered her a plastic bottle to play with. Copying his sister, one-year-old Daniel offered a bottle too, competing for Kaylin's attention. When it was time for me and Kaylin to leave, Bahati seemed disappointed. She wanted us to join the family for lunch. But I said, we really need to leave. She insisted that we at least have some juice, and she joined us at the table while we drank it. That day was a big milestone. Titona had explained our mission and the family had agreed, but we had another big hurdle to cross. So far, we were taking advantage of the fact that the College of Southern Idaho Refugee Center had assigned Lupumba as the interpreter for this family's first weeks in Twin Falls. But who could we recruit to be a volunteer interpreter for us after that point? Lupumba was the obvious choice, and we were in luck. She said yes. Another person we needed to explain our mission to was Allison Bangerter, the volunteer mentor assigned to this family. Titona needed to ask Bangerter to tell her in advance when she plans an outing with the family. Titona missed a trip to the mall that could have been a good part of our story. The official part of the refugee resettlement process was easier to capture. On November 30th, Titona was at the CSI Refugee Center watching Malaboy get an I-9, his employment eligibility verification. Okay. These are your papers for um, when you get a job. Mm -hmm. You will need to show this at your I 94. So keep it in a safe place at home. Okay? Okay, let me take a look. Okay, this is not you. That's for someone else. So I'll forward that. This is from Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's information about your Medicaid, so you can keep that at home. Okay? And I will take care of this one. Okay? Thank you. Thanks. The photographer working with Titona that day was Stephen Reese. His best image from that day shows Bahati trying to fill in the blanks in an English skills assessment. Bahati's head is bowed over the papers with her hand pressed to her forehead. It's a picture of frustration. Here's Stephen. Beatrice was struggling at first, which you can tell in the photo. Rina Garibian, the Refugee Center's English language training coordinator, said that she had the skills to do the English worksheet on her own, but she didn't have the confidence. So after Rina encouraged her a couple of times, Beatrice started connecting the dots and moving through the test at a normal pace. A lot of the transition for these refugees is just getting over the shock and the change of being in a different environment. There's a steep learning curve to living in a different country, and the biggest barrier to get through is language. I was happy with the photo because it shows the frustration of being in a foreign place where people are speaking a different language than you. That day in Malabwe's first English as a second language class, I was surprised to see how much English he already knew. 
One worksheet asked him to identify what colors color? using crayons. Okay. So what color is it? Red. So find the color and you can yes. Yeah. There's a lot of colorful colors in what is it? Orange, yellow, green, green, good. Purple, pink, good. You know the other colors. Where are you from? You're from Congo. Congo? Yeah. Oh, I live in Malawi. Malawi, Congolese. You speak Swahili? Yeah. And? Only Swahili? Only Swahili. French. French and And English? Just no problem. <laughs> okay. While an ESL teacher quizzed Malawi on letters and numbers, other refugees around the room worked on computers. The teacher circled the room, stopping to help anyone who struggled. A B. What is it? Uh -huh. D E. Okay. What is it here? Uh -huh. A B C. F. Yes, you need to write your F, okay? Good. What I want to show you. Nice try, just nice try. No, 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 no. I will show you there is two The ESL teacher seemed impressed with Malabwe too. Now, this is number. Write the number. This is nine, and this is number nine. Thirteen. 13, right? 77, 77. So what is it? 19. 19. So which one is 19? Can you write your 19 number? 19? Oh, yes. <laughs> Good. Okay, now you understand, right? Good job. Covering an ESL class is one thing. Breaking through the barrier of polite formality and really getting to the heart of this family's story will be another thing entirely. Basically, it's a question of trust. Fortunately, we were about to have a breakthrough. You'll hear about it in our next episode. We'll also take you to the doctor's office where the pregnant Bahati learns the sex of her baby and to the ESL class where her husband gets a surprising gift. Refugees in a New Land is produced by The Times News in Twin Falls, Idaho, with Enterprise Editor Virginia Hutchins, reporters Titona Dunlap and Julie Wooten, photographers Drew Nash and Stephen Reese, and digital editor Kyle Hansen. Music by Chris Zabriskie. Find more about this project and complete coverage of South Central Idaho's news at magicvalley.com.